your neck. So if you could wear it correctly, that will avoid you getting in trouble. And, uh, you know, like we always say, if something happens, you don't want to be mistaken. So uh, this is to help you. Also, did receive this in the mail just today. We got one special senior here. Uh, Juniors, most of you know, you're getting ready to take the PSAT. And last year, we took the PSAT, and we had one student uh, who is getting a letter of commendation from the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. And uh, what it is, is they recognize about 34,000 commended students throughout the nation are being recognized for their exceptional academic progress. Although they will not continue in the 2014 National Merit Scholarship Award, commended students placed among the top 5% of more than 2 million students who took the PSAT test last year. The young men and women being named commended students have demonstrated outstanding potential for academic success, uh, commentated a spokesperson for the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. These students represent a valuable national resource, recognizing their accomplishments as well as the key role their school plays in their academic development. It is vital to the advancement of education excellence in our nation. We hope that this recognition will help broaden their educational opportunities and encourage them as they continue their pursuit of academic success. It is our honor to give this certificate of letter of commendation to Alex Hunter. All right. Well, Alex, you're one out of 34,000, so... But that's out of 2 million, so that's really not too bad. And then the last thing here that I need to kind of remind you of, and uh, I I know I've talked to a few of you about this, but let me just remind you, uh, here at school we do have a hands-off policy uh, between boys and girls. So if you could just remember that, and uh, periodically uh, we will have students who forget and we will remind you, and uh, that, that really isn't, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, I guess you could say we just sometimes need a reminder. We all do. I get reminders all the time of things that I need to do. So uh, if you could help us out with that, that would be great. Uh, also, with the advancements in technology, technology is a wonderful thing. But some of you are starting to find out technology does get you in trouble uh, because of different things. Uh, So let me just remind you, uh, with technological advancements, especially being a student at a Christian school, uh, you know, if you were to take a picture of you, not that any of you would do this, I would hope not, but like smoking a cigarette and putting that on your Instagram, you understand if that was brought to our attention. I'll just be honest with you. I don't have Facebook. I don't have Instagram. I have nothing. So everything I get is emailed to me. People email me lots of things. Every day, I get lots of emails from lots of people. And they say, hey, look what your students are doing. And then I get to take care of it. So let me just kind of give you a word of encouragement. Be careful what you put out there. Be careful what you're doing. Uh, you know, we, we would not want you to be smoking or anything. So, uh, and I know most of you, that's not a problem. But sometimes it's always good just to have a nice, friendly reminder uh, because uh, sometimes we just need one. All right? All right, birthdays. I know we got a few. Rebecca Wilds, Alex Hunter. Why don't you guys come up here? Anyone else have a legitimate birthday? Drew's like 82 by now. Faith? Come on up, Faith. Angela, happy birthday. We got some birthday people here. Rebecca's turning 16, 15. Alex, 18, 13, and 13. 
12. All right. Well, Matthew, why don't you come lead them in happy birthday, sing a few songs. Our speaker for today is our IT director at the church, Mr. Matt Turner. So he'll come once Matthew sings a few songs. All right, go ahead and stand up. We're going to start with happy birthday. Happy birthday. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rebecca and Alex and Faith and sorry. Happy birthday. What's her name? Happy birthday, guys. We're gonna sing. We're gonna sing for I'm persuaded. All right, you ready? For I'm persuaded to believe that you can't separate us from the wonderful love of God. From above us, he will love us if you let him live within us. From upon this earth we trod neither height nor death nor principalities, things present nor things to come. And though the devil hates us, he can never separate us from the wonderful love of God. All right, let's go a little bit faster. For I'm persuaded to believe that you can't separate us from the wonderful love of God. From above us, he will love us if you let him live within us. From upon this earth we trod neither height nor death nor principalities, things present nor things to come. And though the devil hates us, he can never separate us from the wonderful love of God. All right, really fast. You ready? For I'm persuaded to believe that you can't separate us from the wonderful love of God. From above us, he will love us if you let from this earth we trod neither height nor death nor principalities, things present nor things to come. And though the devil hates us, he never separates from the wonderful love of God. All right, our last song, we're going to sing Love the Lord Your God right before for the Mac comes. Sorry. Can you redo that? Sorry, my bad. We'll start with the girls. Girls, lead us off, all right? Love the Lord. All right, guys. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and Love all mankind as you would love yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and mind and all mankind. We've got Christian lives to live. We've got Jesus Christ to give. We've got nothing to hide because it's in the way we love. All right, good. We're, we'll, uh, we'll switch it. So, guys, we'll go first, all right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And love all mankind as you would love yourself. Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and mind and all mankind. We've got Christian lives to live. We've got Jesus Christ to give, we've got nothing to hide because it's in the way we love. All right, good job. We, you can be seated for the mat. I got this one on here. Okay, once again, for those of you who, I know we have some new faces and there's some people I haven't met yet, so just so you know who I am, my name is Matt Turner. I am the IT director here for the church and the school. Um, I, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania, I was born and raised there. My dad was in the, uh, the military to pay for his medical school bills. My dad's a doctor. So we traveled around a little bit when I was really little, but he was only in the military to pay for med school, so we didn't stay there very long. So I was born in Pennsylvania. We ended up back there. I basically grew up there, lived my whole life there. Um, uh, my wife is, and I met, when my wife is uh, Mrs. Turner. She teaches uh, third grade, and um, we actually met when we were in seventh. I was in eighth grade, and she was in ninth grade, and um, we went to the same high school, so we kind of grew up together, so uh, that's a little bit about me. I was saved when I was six years old, and uh, I have been 
in an independent Baptist church since about five or six years old and uh, went to West Coast Baptist College and I got a degree in church ministries there. Um, how I became the IT director here, I never really thought I would do this in full-time ministry. I just was, I was that kid that was a complete nerd in high school. Like I got excited when the next Intel Pentium processor was coming out. So, and everybody's looking at me with blank stares, so that's good, because that means you're all now a bunch of nerds too, so that's good. Um, uh, I have a desire to plant a church. That's what I want to do. That's what I feel the Lord wants me to do. And, um, and uh, the Lord, though, has a funny way of using our, um, our likes and interests and things we're good at and talents he's given us to, to, um, to move us forward in life. Like I said, I never thought I would be doing IT work in full-time ministry. And after I graduated Bible college in December of 09, um, in January of 2010, my wife and I got married. And we, uh, we looked for about six or seven months for a church to work at. We had one that we thought lined up, and it just all fell through. And make a long story short, about five churches and five interviews later and five promises for a job later and all of them falling through, I got a call from Dr. Rasmussen, vice president out at West Coast, and he told me that Dr. Norris was looking for a guy who wanted a Bible major, but a guy that knew his computer stuff. So I told him he could give him uh, my phone number. The very next day, Dr. Norris called me, and three weeks later, my wife and I were moving here. So that's my life in a nutshell. There's a whole lot more to my story, a lot more to my testimony, but that's a little bit about me. Uh, if you'll turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, you want to, I'm getting some ringing on these monitors. You want to just, in fact, if you just want to cut the monitors, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's great. That sounds good. Um, Luke chapter 5, this is a very special passage of scripture to me. Um, I mentioned that I, was, I, I got received Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was six years old. My dad, um, when we were younger, uh, we, we used to always do uh, evening devotions. Um, not really as a family, it just was kind of like a my dad and me and my brother thing. And uh, so he would come up to our room, me and him, uh, me and my brother used to share a room when we were younger. Um, and uh, so he would come up every night, we had bunk beds in there, and we would be sitting on our bunk beds and he'd pull a chair up. And uh, we would study some from the Bible. He had some little children's thing. I'm not sure. So I don't know what curriculum was. I don't remember that now. But he was, uh, we were in Luke chapter 5. And we were, and he was, read the part about when Jesus asked the, um, You got it? We good? Woo. Let's all give Mr. Clayton a big hand. Yeah. Alright, I'm just gonna keep going. Hey, 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 let's let's just lose this. Can I have that handheld? I'm just gonna Understand fully problems along with with uh, sound systems. So, as you guys probably know, I do a lot of the sound stuff too myself. I run it sometimes on Wednesday nights, and uh, so I'm familiar with problems and issues with sound systems. So, anyways, um, anyways, my dad got to the part where um, Jesus um, tells uh, Peter to be a fisher of men, and my dad asked me. He said uh, he asked me and my brother both, would we like to be fishers of men? And uh, we both said yes that we did would. So he took us over, walked us to the Romans Road, and that night I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. So this um, this passage of scripture has means a lot to me. So, um, anyways, Luke chapter five. We'll start. We'll go ahead and start in um, verse number one. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them. And were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had, the, when they had this done... They enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, and that they should come and help them. 
And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes, which, were, which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Let's pray. Dear Lord, just thank you for this day, and thank you for this opportunity to preach in chapel today, Lord. Just let these words be your words, Lord, and these thoughts be your thoughts. And just um, let, this, uh, let this message speak to the hearts of the young people here this morning, Lord. And we just ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Um, every time I think of this passage, it brings me back to, I'm fascinated with boats. If you go in, if you go in my office, I have a sailboat um, as my wallpaper on there. That's one of my secret obsessions is to own a, is to own a, um, a sailboat someday. I don't mean just like a little tiny little tiny boat. I mean, I want to own a big sailboat. That, has, has anybody ever seen that fan, that movie? Um, uh, what's that movie called? The, uh, the husband and the wife, they both have their own kids and they get married and he's, a, and he's in the Navy. Yeah, yours, mine, and ours. That's the movie. That's the movie. You know that boat on there that he has and the whole family has to work together to sail that thing? It's, it's more than, that's the type of boat I want to have. Like, I want to I wanna take my whole family out on the boat, and we all, and, and man in this sailboat. That's like a, dr- a secret obsession of mine. I love sailboats. Um, the, the harbor is a, is a place of peace, a place of safety and tranquility. The sounds of the water moving in and out. I just, I love going down to the harbor. It, it's one of my favorite places on earth. I just, I love the sounds of the ocean and the sounds of the birds, the beautiful sunrises and sunsets on the shore. There's this place, and every time I go out to California, my wife and I, we always go down to Highway Number One, the Pacific Coast Highway. We go up to Malibu, and there's this little there's this little place in Malibu we always like to eat at. They, it has a, a pier that goes right out over the ocean, and you're eating right there, and the ocean's right there. But if you go just about a quarter mile past it, you can drive way up on the hillside there in Malibu, and there's all these beautiful houses, and there's one spot between these two houses. It's a vacant lot, and it's just sandy. It's just sandy there, and we'll pull right into that, and you're just out. I mean, it's just ocean is all you see. That's all that's in front of you is ocean, and I love to go down there early in the morning and watch the sunrise or us to go down there when it's, when it's just about time for sunset and watch the sunset over the ocean. That's the most beautiful scene that you could ever see in your life. The purpose of the harbor, though, is not to be a, just for a place of relaxation. It's not just for a place of rest. I mean, what would be the fun in boats if all you ever did was go get into it while it's sitting there in the harbor? There, there'd, be no, there'd be no excitement about it. There'd be no adventure. There'd be no fun. It just would sit there. The point of the harbor is for you to come and, yes, get your rest and get that relaxation, but then to launch out from it. It's not meant for you to stay there. The excitement is out on the water, not in the harbor. And today, as Christians, we've chosen that we think it's easier to just stay anchored. To just stay there at the harbor. We've chosen that. Because it's a whole lot easier just to keep our mouth shut and not say anything. It's a whole lot easier just to go with the flow. It's a whole lot easier not to stand up for what's right. And we, we've been in this battle for a very long time, especially in our nation. We can go all the way back to the 1960s and look at the attack on, on the Bible in, in schools and prayer in the schools I mean, we've been fighting this battle for so long as Christians of progressing our faith and keeping a hold of our faith and telling others about it. We have fought, it's been a, it's, especially in the past couple of years, if you watch anything on the news and you hear anything about what's going on, it's a battle. It is a day and night battle, 24-7. And we're being attacked from all sides, from all sides. And we're we're starting to get to this point, I'm afraid, 
especially when you look at some of the, the, the main denominations out there and some of the large churches that we have in our country, it's becoming very apparent that we're all coming back to bay. We, we've decided that we're, we've toiled all the night and we're tired of toiling and we're pulling our nets in and we're saying it doesn't work anymore and we're cleaning them. And the, the sad thing is the world not only is not staying at bay, but they're building bigger ships. And they're building bigger nets. And they're figuring out ways to progress their message more and more and more and more. And we're trying to do less and less and less. And we're just containing to ourselves. And we're compromising our messages. You'll hear pastors all the time. There's some pastors I could name names of people that I'm sure you know of who grew up. Some of these guys even grew up like us here at this church. Believe like we believe. And now if you ask them today what it means to be saved and what it means to go to heaven, they'll tell you that anything you believe that gets you to heaven will get you there. I mean, who would have ever thought we'd see the day that the Pope said would say, the Pope, I mean, not that we're obviously for Catholicism here, but of all people, the Pope came out and said the other day that you don't even need to believe in Jesus and God to go to heaven. I mean, does that even make sense? That doesn't even make sense. You don't even have to believe in Jesus and God to go to heaven. That's where we're at. We need to see, the, the, the thing that I pull the most out of this, out of this whole passage, the, the, over the years I've, I've read it many times, because like I said, it has a lot of importance to me, it has a lot of importance to me, because this is the passage that's responsible for me just making a decision to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. The most important statement of all of this passage that we can look through to me is, when Peter said those words, nevertheless I will. Nevertheless, I will. Because there's, there's an important thing to learn about Peter. And, and I think this is one reason why we see Peter a lot. I mean, there's some of the disciples, you never even really hear anything about them. But Peter, you know, we hear a lot about Peter. Peter makes a lot of dumb decisions. He makes a lot of dumb mistakes. You know, he does a lot of good things, too. But he, he does a whole lot more stupid things than he does good things most of the time. Peter is a perfect representation of the church today. Perfect representation of us today. I mean, his life, looking at him as a fisherman, he toiled and toiled and toiled all that night, and he was done. And we can see throughout his life then, he makes all kinds of dumb mistakes. He never does the right thing. It's a perfect example of us. I don't know about anybody else here, but I, I'm a numbskull. I do the wrong thing every day. <laughs> you know, if it wasn't for Lord Jesus Christ, you know, and... Seeking him, I would make the wrong decisions in every situation. We're imperfect man, and Peter is the perfect example of that. But the statement he made, the statement he made that day, nevertheless I will, that, that's the difference between what we used to be in our circles and what Peter was, what we should be. That's the difference of what we should be and what we are today. Because he, he, the fact that he said that, he still was a numbskull. He still did the wrong thing. He still toiled all the night. He still did everything in his own power. He still didn't do it the right way. But at the end of the day, he still said, nevertheless, I will, at thy word. He said, I'm tired. I've cleaned my nets. Uh, I'm, I've, I've been out there all night long. I am an expert in my field, an expert in my field. I mean, him and, and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, they, they, were, they were the three best fishermen in all of the area, in all the region. As easy to say that, that they were, because if you look back in history and you look back at, our, at, 
at maps and you even look at what's been uncovered archaeologically in that area, that city that they were from, it's actually very, very small. It's very possible that for that city and that town there that they were the only fishermen there. These guys were the best. And even being the best, he knew where every spot was, where every spot was in that whole lake, that whole sea. There's no question he knew where the fish were. He knew where they went and what time they went there. Yeah, he still didn't catch any. And I can almost imagine him because, but put yourself in, in kind of putting myself in Peter's personality and just looking at it. I mean, I think it's easy for us to see his personality. I can almost imagine him shaking his head and, and reading into it a little bit. I could imagine him almost saying, well, you know, I'm only the one that does this for a living, their Lord. Because remember, at this time, P- Peter wasn't a follower of Christ necessarily yet. He, he had been with him at other times. If we look in the book of John in chapters, I think it's 1, 2, and 3, or 4, something like that. In the chapters 1, 2, and 4, we see Peter with Jesus at different things. Pete, and at that time, Peter was not a disciple. I used, to get the, I, used to, I, I used to get that wrong in my mind. I used to think that just because they're in different books that this happened first and those other events happened. No, they didn't actually. Those, those other events, he was there, but he wasn't, he wasn't necessarily, he hadn't surrendered to follow yet, but he had followed, though. He, had, he was there at, the, at the, the first miracle. He experienced that. He watched it happen there at the wedding. He was there at the baptism of Jesus. He had witnessed Jesus and followed him and seen him, but he, he wasn't calling him master yet. He wasn't his follower yet. I can imagine him in his stubborn attitude that he always has, being like, no, Lord, okay, Lord, you, you know, I, I'm only the professional here. I know what I'm doing. I've been fishing for a long time. We, we, we've fished all night. I know where these fish are. If they're not there, that means they're not coming tonight. They're not going to be there. There's no more. So it's time to just quit. But, but nevertheless, at thy word, at thy word, I will. I'll do it. I'll do it. Because I saw you do that miracle that one time, and I saw that dove come down and heard, heard God speak. So, you know, because of that, you know, I'll respect you enough. You know, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go ahead and we'll do it. We'll do it. The one thing I want to give Peter, though, is even though I'm sure that's what his attitude was that day, at least he did say that nevertheless I will. Because, see, we're the same way today. We've been doing church for a long time now. We've been doing church for a long time. And we, we know how to run church. We, we know how to run church. You can go and read a thousand blogs about it. It's down to a science how to build a church if you want to build a church. And anybody can go and build a church and build a big one. And there's a lot more big ones than you think. I think we have this idea that it's a dying animal. There are a lot of large churches. There's over, I think it's over 75 or 100 churches that exceed 10,000 in our country alone. So there's large, big church is actually still a, a big thing. You can go build a big church. Just like these guys, they became, you can become a professional at running a church. You can become a professional at going and trying to reach people for Christ. But at the end of the day, though, that's not going to work. And we're seeing that today. We're seeing that today. Because we live in a country that has churches like that, huge churches. I mean, we, 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 live, in a, I mean, we live here in a town that we have one church that they run several thousand on Sundays. Here, and there's our church, and there's, I mean, there's dozens of churches right here in Rutherford County. You know, and I know not everywhere in America is like that, but we live in a country that is full of churches, full of churches. Yet somehow, somehow, we're losing every single battle there is to be fought. Every one. Everyone. We're losing the we're losing our youth. We're losing we're losing the battle against homosexuality. We're losing we already lost the battle decades ago of the Bible in schools and prayer in the schools. (coughs) 
Why is that? How can that be true? How can we be, live in a nation that's so good at doing church? A nation that was founded on the Bible. I mean, you go back and study these men. They, these were men of God that started this nation. I mean, you go back and you, you read the prayer journals of George Washington, and you'll, you'll believe very quickly that he was a man of God. A man led by God, a man filled of God. How, how, how did this happen? We look at Peter. He's in the same conundrum. He's, he has the same problem. P Peter, here he is. He's become a profession in his trade. He is the best fisherman in the land, yet he can't catch any fish. And this is his lifeblood, too. With, without fish, he doesn't have anything to go to market with. If he has nothing to go to market with, he has, doesn't have any money. If he doesn't have any money, he doesn't buy food and put it on the table. So if he has a day he doesn't bring fish home, guess what? They're not eating sometime that week. So how, how, does, how does the best fisherman in the land not catch any fish? Peter's problem, and this is our problem today. This is our problem today. I have a big old outline here, but we're just gonna we're just gonna focus on this one point. We, our problem today is we do everything in our own power. We wake up in the morning in our power. We go to bed at night in our own power. We pray for our food, maybe, and even in doing that, we. We mention, we say the same phrase every time we sit down and we pray for it. It's, it's robotic and mechanic. You know, I, half the time, I bet if I asked you what you just prayed, you probably couldn't even tell me because it's just such a robotic thing. I'm praying for my food. This is what I say before I eat. There's no meaning to it. And to be honest, if there's no meaning to it, you're not really talking to God. You're just doing it out of duty. That's the way Peter was here. Peter was doing everything in his own power. He was doing it by his knowledge, by his strength, by everything he had ever learned about being a fisherman. But he left God out of it. And he utterly failed. Failed so badly that he gave up. And started cleaning the nets. If we don't figure out a way to get a hold of God again in our lives, individually, not as, not as a church, not as a movement, not, a, not as a nation, each one of us individually, as individual Christians, if we don't figure out a way how to get a hold of God and get God in our lives, then we, we really are going to lose this. We're going to. This luxury of a Christian school that we have here, it's a wonderful thing. It's a truly wonderful thing. We're not going to have it forever, though. It's not something that we have the right to. It's something that we've earned. Something that our forefathers earned for us. They had to shed their blood for it so that we could have a nation that we can do these things in. Have a church and have a Christian school and a place we can come and believe freely as we want to. And worship God freely as we want to. It was hard work. And there were real battles they fought. I'm sure glad they didn't get weary and they didn't just toil all the night with their knowledge of how to fight on the battlefield. Because if they would have done that, we probably wouldn't be a nation here today because it was a bunch of farmers and unqualified men that fought for us. 
It's a good thing they didn't do it in their own might, in their own power, in their own knowledge. They did it with God's help and with much, much prayer and fasting and getting a hold of the face of God. And today, young people, I don't know what it's going to take, but I'll, I'll tell you this right now. I'm a young fundamentalist myself. I mean, I'm, I'm only 26 years old. So, and some of you are thinking, man, you're really old. I'm only 26 years old. You'll find out really quickly that's not very old. And I feel the same way that I'm sure you guys do and what you think every day. I feel like I've been failed. I feel like those who came before me let me down. They, they rode the faith of other men and the prayers of other men and the work of other men and the toil of other men. And now my generation is left here and your generation is left here to clean up the mess. And it's hard to accept that. I know there's many days I'll hear about something that's happening inside of churches, specifically our kind of churches, and it will frustrate me. Because I don't want to have to fight the fight and the battles of these other men and fix their problems and need to worry about their problems. It gets weary and toiling in it. The thing is, though, that, that generation, they're, they're going off the scene and our generation is the one coming. I mean, yes, I'm only 26, and yes, that is young, but I mean, it won't be very long till I'm 35, it won't be very long till I'm 40, it won't be very long till I'm that generation that there's young people your age that are looking to me and seeing what I've done for them and what work I've done for the faith, for Christianity. And what, what's going to determine is if I've changed anything for them isn't what I do when I get there. It's what I do now. It's what I do right now in my life. It's the same for you guys. Like I said, you guys are not really too far off of, from me. There's, there's ones of you in here that I'm not even 10 years older than you. That, that makes us in the same generation. So it, it, it depends. The future of what we do and of our faith depends on decisions you're making today. If you look at Charles Spurgeon, if you look at Charles Spurgeon, you know how old he was when he preached his first message? He was 12. He pastored his first church at 15. 15 years old is when he started pastoring. I'm not saying there's a 15-year-old in here that needs to go and quit, quit high school and go plant a church. I'm just saying one man made a decision that he was going to go and do something about his faith. And he didn't wait till he got there. He didn't wait till he was older. He didn't say, well, when I get there, when I am a leader someday, you know, when I am running a church someday. No, he made a decision. I'm going to make a difference right now. And I'm not going to do it in my own power. I'm going to do it with the power of God. Spurgeon's church was known for having hundreds of men. that would, They had a room underneath the pulpit that hundreds of men would gather. And they would pray during the services because that church knew they could do nothing. They could do nothing but by prayer and fasting, nothing, nothing by their own might because if they did it by their own might, they'd be toiling all the night like Peter did. And yeah, they might build some big church and they might, you know, become successful and well-known and famous people. They might be able to do that. But will they really make a difference for God? Will they really make a difference in this world for God? And we, we, need, some, we need some 
Christian young people in this room today to be those ones to say, I'm tired of toiling. I'm tired of, of trying to do my devotions and to do what's right and, the, and to read my Bible and, and to listen to Brother Kurt and to obey the rules and, and try to figure out what God has for my life. We need some young people to say, even though it's tiring and it's hard and there's temptations all about me and the pressure of the world all about me, Everywhere I turn, we need some young people that will say, nevertheless, I will. I might not have the strength to do it. I might not even have all the faith that I need to know that it will happen. But if you tell me to, if you say at thy word, if your word tells me to, I will. I'll do it. I'll do it. Peter, I guarantee you here, Look at the words. Peter did not believe there'd be any fish caught that day. He did not believe it. If you look at this world today, it's very hard to believe that anything will ever change. It's very hard to believe it. But every time I look back to that word, I see at thy word, at thy word. I see what his word says. I see what he tells us. I see what he promises. And it doesn't matter what I know or what's encompassed about me. If he says it, it's true. And whether I think or I struggle about it or whatever, it doesn't matter if he says it at thy word. Nevertheless, it does not matter what I think. It does not matter what I know. It does not matter what I've seen. But at thy word, I will let down the nets. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy because no, notice the, the phrasing there. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here. No, notice, the, notice the phrasing there that when he tells him to launch out, he tells him to launch out into the deep. Into the deep is a very important part of the phrasing that he says. Because, you know, the, the fish, the deep was hard for them, the fishing. Because you got to remember, this is, this is ancient Israel. They don't have big, huge commercial line fishing nets like they have today. You know, they had these smaller nets that they could throw out that one man could handle that were all man-made completely. So the shallow water, that was the water where you tried to fish in. It's going to be easier to catch the fish. The fish are going to be closer to the surface. Where there's shallow spots, that's the best place to go. And it's easier. It's much easier. I'm sure Peter was saying in his mind that day, why into the deep? We're not going to catch anything out there. We don't have the type of nets we need. We're poor. We have these little boats. I should have used my slides today. I have a picture of a Galilean fishing boat. Not much bigger, not much wider than this piece of platform right here. That's what they had to fish from. And I'm sure he's, why, why in the world are we going to go out here? There's not going to be any fish there. In the deep is where we will see God perform something amazing in our lives. I mean, really think about how many fish, how many fish it would have had to take to actually sink a boat. And not only sink a boat, sink two boats. That's a lot of fish. If we just have that faith to say, nevertheless, I will, at thy word, I will, it doesn't matter what I think, it doesn't matter how much I've struggled, it doesn't matter how much I've toiled, but at thy word, I'm going to go out, I'm going to let down the nets, I'm going to even go out onto the deep. I'm going to go out into the stormy water, the water where the sharks live, where the world's at, where the opposition will come. I'm going to go there because you told me to. I'm not going to go there in my own power. I'm going to seek your face. I'm going to get your wind underneath my sails. I'm going to let you carry me out into the deep. I'm going to let down my nets there. I'm going to trust that you're going to do it because I can't.
If you have faith like that in God, I promise you, young person, you'll see something amazing happen in your life. I promise you. More importantly, God promises you. Because he said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. He promised him. He said, you let down, you go out there into the deep, Peter. You take me out there right now. It's amazing. Look how far Christ even goes to get a hold of us. You know how inconvenient it would have been to have preached from a boat? I mean, the boat's not standing still. It's choppy water there on the Sea of Galilee. It's stormy always on the Sea of Galilee. The water's never settled. It would have been loud from the water. It would not have helped him at all. There's a hillside. It would have been much better for him to go up and stand at the bottom of the hillside and have all the people up on the hillside. But no, he called the people to the beach, and he went out on the boat. Terrible conditions for preaching. All so that he could get Peter there when he was done and say, hey, Peter, I see that uh, you pulled your nets in already. You didn't get any of your fish. No, Lord, there's no fish. Oh, yeah, Peter, no, no, no. Go out. And, let's launch out here. Go out into the deep. Let down the nets again, and you'll bring in fish. You'll catch them. I'm telling you, you'll catch them if you go there. If you do what I'm saying for you to do, you'll catch them. And he caught them. He didn't believe he would, but he did. Nevertheless, at thy word. Nevertheless, I don't know what it is in your life today, young person, that's keeping you back, that's making you shut down and give up and give in and just be like the world and not care about your faith and then just give in everything that everyone's saying. I don't know what it is and what's going on in your life. But the Lord Jesus Christ today is asking you to let down your nets. I don't know what you have to let your nets down into. I don't know what's going on in your lives, but he wants you to let down your nets in those situations. In those struggles that you have, that battle that you're facing. He wants you to let down your nets. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. I just thank you for this, these young people, Lord, and we just thank you for your precious word, Lord, and I don't know what's, what storms may be in these, the lives of these teenagers here today, Lord, and I don't know what troubles they might face, and I don't know how many times they've gone out, Lord, and they've toiled and toiled and toiled in their faith, and they're ready to give up, and they're ready to not do anything for you, and they're ready not to follow you, and they're ready just to follow in the ways of the world, and just give in, and just be like the rest of everybody else. But Lord, I ask you, just give them that little ounce of your spirit, Lord, that little bit of faith and hope to believe enough in you to say, nevertheless, at thy word, I will. And be with us as we go through the school year, Lord, that will keep that spirit, that there'll be a spirit of nevertheless in this school, Lord. There'll be a spirit of wanting to follow you, and no matter what, no matter what might come and what friends might they might hurt, Lord, or what men friends they might lose, Lord, from, from saying nevertheless at thy word and doing what's right and standing up for you, Lord, that they'll be strong. And that they won't grow weary in the toiling and they'll just wait till you let them, till your power comes and you let them draw in that large draft of fishes, Lord, in their lives. Just be with us as a school, Lord. Just bless us. Just keep a hedge of protection about. Be with our pastor, Lord, as he leads. Just give him a special... A portion of your spirit, Lord, as he leads, and and grace, Lord, and wisdom as he guides and leads, and be with Mr. Kramer as he leads the school, Lord. Just give him wisdom as he does that. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.